sermon is going to be 2 Timothy 3.16. All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. Now, theopneustros is, is the word in Greek that Paul was using when he wrote to Timothy, and that means God-breathed. God in other words, it's directly coming from the mouth of God. And all scripture is useful. Now, it's useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training. Uh, there's a lot of things that can teach us. I got a textbook sitting next to me from my history class that teaches. Uh, I can grab a dictionary and that corrects spelling. But none of those things are the same as the Bible. The Bible is, is unique in that it does all these things at the same time. 2 Peter 1.21 says, For prophecy never had its origin in the human will, but prophets, though human, spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Yeah. 1 Corinthians 2.13 says, This is what we speak. Not in words taught us by human wisdom, but in words taught by the Spirit, explaining spiritual reality with Spirit-taught words. And John 5.39 says, You study the Scriptures diligently because you think that in them you have eternal life. These are the very Scriptures that testify about me. That was Jesus talking to the Pharisees. So as we go and we take a look at Scripture, I want to take a look at Scripture from different concepts here. Okay? The first thing is that... I'll try again. The Bible itself, as a... They aren't getting it, I think. All right, we're going to pause and start over because apparently some people aren't getting it. So, Keep Although I know a lot of people are watching. We're just going to continue on with this and I'll post it up later. If you don't get it, we'll post it to the video or post it to, to Facebook and you okay. can watch it that way. Okay. All right, getting back online here. Um, the, just some, some simple things about the Bible. First of all, uh, there was 40 different authors. It was written over a period of about 1,500 years. Now, academically, uh, historical documents are studied, and the manuscripts are actually looked at to check for whether or not something has historically been, been created on a regular basis and whether or not it is factual. And of all the historical documents that are, we have anything of in the world, the Bible has the most factual basis behind it. There are over 25,000 manuscripts, number one in all historical documents, and there's a 98% accuracy when comparing the different manuscripts, which is almost unheard of. 95% of the entire Bible is considered more accurate than any of the manuscripts in the world. The Old Testament, we do not have very old copies of it, and that is primarily because as the medium that they were written on, whether it's vellum or papyrus, once that wore out, it was destroyed by the Jewish writers that were, were copying it. But in their effort to copy and their reverence for the documents, they, they copied them very, very, very closely. So even though we didn't have old historical documents, we still had close copies. And that was proven through the Dead Sea Scrolls, who we've, which we found, which backdated all these things, and were still connected word for word with the documents there are. Now I have a concept here I want to put forth. I know that... Um, some people think of the Bible as a window, and I can't disagree with that, uh, as it's a window into God, but it, I think for us, more than a window, I think it needs to be a mirror. And what I mean by that is that we should be looking at the Bible from the lens of how we apply it to our own lives. Now, there's the coloring book version of the Bible. You've heard me talk about this before. The coloring book version of the Bible simply states that... Uh, we have pictures of Samson and Noah and David and Goliath and Jonah. Different things that you get in Sunday school when you're little. And you have that picture in them. And a lot of times we stop there. We stop with the coloring book version. We don't go any farther. I remember as a kid uh, visiting the, one of the clinics, I had allergies as a kid and I got shots a lot. And waiting in line, to, or waiting in the waiting room to get in, they had a picture version of the Bible sitting there in the clinic, which is kind of a cool thing. Growing up, I was never encouraged to read the Bible for myself. I was just told what it said. That's fine if you're a child, but it should get deeper and deeper as you, as you get older and come to that realization that Christ is your Lord and Savior. You should be getting to know Him more and more. Now I'm going to give you an example from the Bible on one of those characters I just talked about on how we can apply it to ourselves. And I'm going to go to a very familiar one, again, the coloring book version of Jonah. And Jonah and the whale. So what do we know factually from the Bible? Well, Jonah 1, verses 1 and 2, 
It says, The word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai. Go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it, because its wickedness has come, come up before me. So we know Jonah was called by God. Now, Jonah screws up a lot in this story. He, he does a, a lot of things wrong, in the same way that we would too. But, in the context here, God called Jonah. There was a reason God called Jonah. There must have been something there. So we know the story from then. Jonah was sent to Nineveh. Nineveh, historically, Nineveh was, let the history teacher and me come out, was the capital of the Assyrian Empire at the time. This is during the, the time of King Hezekiah of Israel. And the Assyrians were a very powerful empire and were a great threat to Israel. So Nineveh would have not been seen in a positive way by most Isra Israelites at the time. So as Jonah is being sent to save Nineveh, he's upset with that. He basically thinks God is wrong. So what happens is he tries to run away. He tries to flee from God. We know about the great fish, all that kind of stuff. But Nona does, or Jonah does end up uh, preaching in Nineveh, and they repent. They go on a, on a fast, and they repent. Now, the part that isn't in most of the coloring books is what happens after that. Because while Jonah repented from running away from God, uh, primarily because of the consequences he had, and then went through with it, he still wasn't happy with what God was doing. And this is where I think some of the lessons apply to our lives. I'm going to read towards the end of, of the book of Jonah here, and how after, after uh, Nineveh had um, repented, Jonah was pretty upset. And he went outside the city and he sat down to see what God was going to do. In his eyes, he would love it if God had destroyed Nineveh. That, in, in his human wisdom, that was the best, he, that's the best outcome that could have happened. But that's not what God did. And when we look at that, we see one of the characteristics of God is that while he was blessing Israel, he also had other people in mind. He took, he, he took compassion on everyone. And that, in, that promise of compassion goes through to today. So I'm going to read now from Jonah 4, verses 6 through 11. So Jonah is sitting outside, the, outside of Nineveh watching it. And he just sits down and it's hot. And then uh, starting in verse 6, it says, Then the Lord provided a leafy plant and made it grow up over Jonah to give shade over his head to ease his discomfort. And Jonah was very happy about the plant. But at dawn the next day, God provided a worm which chewed the plant so that it withered. When the sun rose, God provided a scorching east wind, and the sun blazed on Jonah's head so that he grew faint. He wanted to die and said, It would be better for me to die than to live. But God said to Jonah, Is it right for you to be angry about the plant? It is, he said, and I'm so angry I wish I were dead. I, I, when I read those things, it sounds like something a little kid would say. And then in verse 10, But the Lord said, You have been concerned about this plant, though you did not tend it or make it grow. It sprang up overnight and died overnight. And should I not have concern for the great city of Nineveh, in which there are more than 120,000 people who cannot tell their right hand from their left, and also many animals? So the application there, when I look at that from my own perspective, is if I look, especially in a time like we're in right now, where there's a time of great conflict and a lot of issues going on, Jonah looked at it and said, well, I'm righteous, they're not, they should be punished, I should be blessed. And God says, I want to bless someone. And Jonah said, but I don't think they're worthy. So there's an application right there. There's the mirror right there. Instead of looking at Jonah and saying where Jonah was wrong, we should be looking at ourselves and see where we go wrong in the same way, where we have the same issues, where we have the same problems. And I've caught myself doing these things, and I, I've, I've, seen it in my, I've seen it in my own life. But I think that's part of what the Bible is. That's where the mirror aspect comes in. Now, if we truly want to understand, <coughs> excuse me, we truly want to understand how this mirror aspect applies to us, we need to get into the Word. And you've heard this in my sermons before. I, I am constantly telling you we need to get into the Word. We need to get into the Word. Well, I'm going to give you some points now that I think will explain why we need to get into the Word and how we need to get into the Word. So number one is you need to read the Bible for yourself. Like I said, I've never, I was never as a child encouraged to read the Bible for myself. 
Uh, he grew up Catholic. He would show up at church on Sunday and they would hand you a missalette, which was a book with uh, quoted Bible verses in there and you could read along with the person that read it. And then they would do uh, a liturgy based around that and a sermon based around that. But studying it yourself was, was a strange concept. That was new. And I have learned uh, through my own life over time that getting into the Word myself makes all the difference in the world. That's where I really get my connection with God. I can't have someone tell me it. I have to read it for myself. When I read it for myself, I understand a few things. I understand God's interaction with man. I understand God's plan for redemption, God's promises, and I begin to get an understanding of God's character. That's a very different concept than having someone explain it to you. Now you're personalizing it. As you personalize it, you personalize your relationship with God. 2 Timothy 2.15 says, Do your best to prevent yourself to, one, to God as one approved, a worker who does not need to be ashamed and who correctly handles the word of truth. So correctly handling the word of truth is actually using it yourself, reading it yourself. You need to study the Bible by yourself. Now, studying and reading are not the, not the same thing. Yeah. Point number two, studying and reading are not exactly the same thing. You can read things and not study. As a teacher, I know this. I can have students read their textbooks and nothing sticks in their head. Studying is completely different. We are blessed in this, in this day and age. Uh, everyone who is listening to me right now has access to a computer, obviously, or to the Internet in one way, shape, or the other. And we also have access to commentaries, Bible studies. There's a lot of different things that we can get into to help us study the Word. One of the greatest things we have is Sunday school. At our church, Adult Sunday School, when we get together and we discuss it and we talk about it. God will reveal things to different people and they share it and the light bulbs come on and say, boy, I never looked at it that way. Someone have, have, may have different, as, different aspects of, of what, they, what they see and what they do. And by sharing that with each other, we get a deeper understanding. So all of these things are available for us so that we can study it more, we can get more in depth, go beyond, if you will, the coloring book version. Psalm 119.11 was a psalm that David wrote trying to teach his children, teach his son about the Word and about God. And in Psalm 19, uh, 119.11 it says, I've hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. That's where studying becomes so important. And it's the same thing when I teach students to study. When I present a lesson to the students and they have study guides and they take notes and they do all those things, it's in preparation for a test. That's why you study. You study to prepare for tests. Our life is our test. So if we want to do well on our life as the test, we need to study the Word of God to apply that to our lives so that we can change who we are because we studied and as David said, hide it inside your heart. Make it part of you. Now number three, point number three is that we need to meditate on the Word. Edmund, a quote from Edmund Burke says, to read without reflecting is like eating without digesting. Mm, that's good. Amen. That is an interesting concept because if you read, you can read something and not pay any attention to it, even though you read through it. One of the things I find when I read the Bible is I can read the same thing over and over again and get something new out of it every time. I'll read something and say, well, I know I've read that before because I've read it cover to cover, but God decided to pull something out for me and, and put it on my plate so that it's something new for me. As we meditate on the Bible, as we look at the Bible, as we go through the Bible itself, God will continue to reveal things to you. So that meditation is one of those things that it becomes a personal thing for you too. You spend time in contemplation. You spend time in prayer with God. You spend time looking into God's Word and trying to figure out more than just a surface. Now, Matthew 13, 19 says, When anyone hears the message about the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what was sown in their heart. This is the seed sown along the path. This is obviously from the parable of the sower where the seed was cast out, and if you do not meditate on it, if you do not spend time working with it, if you do not spend time in prayer about God's Word, it's not going to take root in your life. 
we have to get an understanding of it beyond the mere words. And that might be comparative things, that might be part of studying, but also once you grasp a concept, you need to put it inside yourself and make it part of you. Through meditation, we can get to that. Now, the fourth thing I want to add in is that we need to apply the word. The word is not useful in our life if it's not something that we actually apply. James 1.22 said, Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourself. Do what it says. Now, in doing what it says, as we go into this and we do what it says, we start to actually change our lives. And the Bible becomes alive in us, to us, and through us. The Great Commission says we are to make believers of all nations. Now, to do that, we share the gospel. How can we share the gospel if we're not applying it to our own lives? How can we fulfill the Great Commission if we're not applying it to our own lives? read a funny little little thing from Reader's Digest. Um, a woman uh, wrote it down here. Eleanor Schmidt wrote this down. She talked about going in for surgery. She was going in for surgery and she was kind of nervous about it. And as she walked in, she saw this young surgeon that she had already talked to sitting down reading a book. And when he sees her coming, he closes the book and stands up and she realizes the book he was reading was the Bible. And she looks at him and, and in her nervousness says, does that help you before or after the surgery? And he just smiled at her and said, during. That made her a lot calmer about the surgery she was about to go into. That, ex that explanation, as we go through it, that explanation of the Bible, that application is where the rubber hits the road. That's where we really become Christians. Until we get to that point where we have a full understanding and an application in our own lives, how can we call ourselves Christians? How can we be following the Word if we're not involved in the Word? Now, God gave us a special gift in this application, though, too. It goes beyond just the gift of the Word itself. The Bible, I have no doubt, is a, is a gift from God. He has an application, uh, an intention for that. Jesus came to save us. He walked on this earth. He, he lived on this earth. He went through everything we went through. And he suffered and he died, was buried and resurrected. We serve a living Savior. But in between the time of the birth and the death of Jesus, like I like to say about on a tombstone in the dash between birthday and, and death day, Jesus taught. He taught a lot. Through his parables, through his, through his sermons, he taught us a lot about what we needed to know about God. Through Him, we got a greater understanding in the New Testament than we even had in the Old Testament about who God is and how much God loves us. In addition, we were given one more thing that will help us in the application of the Word and in our study and our meditation and all of our understanding. And that is that the Holy Spirit was sent for that purpose. John 14, 16-17 and I will ask the Father, and He will give you another advocate to help you and be, your, be with you forever, the Spirit of Truth. The world cannot accept Him because it neither believes Him nor knows Him. But you will know Him, for He lives with you and will be in you. What a blessing that is that we don't have to lean on our own understanding. I'm not a, I'm not, I don't have a doctoral degree. I'm not a seminary student. God has led me to where I am. And through His Word, I've been able to, to hopefully grab a hold of things, apply it in my own life, and preach it as God gives it to me, as God gives me the words. But that's through the Holy Spirit. If you don't have the Holy Spirit active in your life, there's no way you're truly applying the Word, because God gave us that. That is a tool that God gave us that He intended for us to use on a daily basis. If we're not using it, we're losing it. That's as simple as that. John 16, 13, But when He, the Spirit of truth, comes, He will guide you into all truth. He will not speak on His own. He will speak only what He hears, and He will tell you what is yet to come. What a blessing that is, that God gives us a guide in, the, in this process. One, I, I read another interesting little quote talking about uh, the Bible itself. And while... It, we can go through all the academic things and look at all the manuscripts and all the things that we use to prove the Bible is truth. Some people still don't accept it. Some people will still reject the Bible. 
They'll try and find conflict. They'll try and find contradiction. They'll try and find problems there. Well, as Paul said in Timothy, it is all God-breathed. And the quote that I really like said, Men do not reject the Bible because it contradicts itself, but because it contradicts them. What you see in the Bible is the truth. If you don't like it, you need to reevaluate you. Look in that mirror. Look strongly in that mirror at yourself with an honest eye and say, Am I the problem here? Because God's not. God loves you so much that He sent His Son. He loved us before we even knew Him. He loved me before I accepted Him. He accepted me first. That concept of God's love might be hard for some people to understand, but it's laid out over and over and over again in the Word. The more you get into the Word, the more peace you will have. The more God will bring you together in that. As we look at the Word then, Let's just reach out and grab a hold of something. Right now in this time where there's a lot of fear, there's a lot of, uh, of concern, there's panic, all these other things going on in the world, we need to have something we can grab a hold of. We need to have some sort of absolute truth. You can watch a 24-hour news cycle and have talking heads going on constantly about COVID-19 and all the other things that are going on and how long it's going to last and how many people are going to die and all these terrible things. Nothing, nothing grabs the world attention, world's attention better than the worst-case scenario. But we as Christians need to understand the best-case scenario. And the best-case scenario is simple. God loves you. But the world is falling apart. But God loves you. But we have no control over this virus. God does and God loves you. So we don't have to live in fear. We need to live in peace. And by reading, studying, meditating, and applying the word, that's where we get it. Because the written word leads us to the living word, which is Jesus. The word made texts will lead us to the word made flesh. And that makes all the difference. Let's pray. Father, I thank you again.